Hi everyone, this is survey analysis part two, focused on exploratory factor analysis. So we're still in this idea, this framework of classical test theory, where your observed score is equal to your true score plus some error. There are assumptions with this that are not explicitly tested, sort of. Um, they're just assumed to be true. So for factor analysis, this is something that some surveys need, but just because you have a survey doesn't mean you're going to be doing factor analysis. This is usually used with established measures, or if you have used, or if you have created a survey and you think that there are multiple ideas within it, it's not just one solid idea, this allows you to test and see what items group with what other items. This video is focused on exploratory factor analysis, but there are two different types. So with exploratory factor analysis, there is no preconceived notion on what items group with what. We are just letting the math group however the items want to. And what we're doing is we're looking for patterns of correlations above, um, among the different items. So we're looking at what items group together, what items kind of hang out together um, based on their correlations with each other. Confirmatory factor analysis does the opposite. So it forces the math to fit a specific model that you have already identified. So you're going to say these five items group with this idea and you're going to force it and then see how that model fits. Factor extraction is really what all this is about with EFA. And it's kind of weird. <laughs> so we're looking for packets of variance. So we're gonna correlate all the items together and we're going to see where the strongest groupings are and how the different items fall together in these packets of variance. So this first factor that you find is going to be the largest packet of variance. The second factor will explain the next largest and so on. And you'll see the different numbers of factors as we go. But here's what we're doing. So if we had five different items, one on Head Start, one on healthcare, one on welfare, one on law enforcement, and one on defense. I'm going to correlate people's responses on these five items to their responses on the other five items. So this is just a simple correlation table. And we can see that one and two are highly correlated to each other. One and three are highly correlated to each other. Now item one is not correlated with item four or with item five. So if we go through this correlation matrix and we get rid of all of the smaller correlations and we just keep the strong correlations of above a 0.4, we're going to see that it groups into two, two different ideas. So these first three items are highly correlated to each other and the second two, the f last two items are highly correlated to each other. I'm going to name them. So this is factor one with the first three and they're all about social programs. So I'm gonna call factor one fact social programs. Factor two is about security and order. You can name them whatever makes sense depending on the item content and what it's really about. Sometimes the loadings aren't as clear though, which makes it more fun. So we're looking at factor loadings typically above a 0.4. So here, these are good correlations to each other, but this one is not quite as strong. And the same here. In fact, this last one is really concerning because it's actually loading on both factors. That's a problem. We want each item to load specifically on one idea or another idea. Otherwise, it just kind of muddies the water. Another thing that we're going to be looking at are eigenvalues. All you need to know about an eigenvalue is that it has to do with matrix and vectors, but really anything over a one is what we're going to call a factor or a potential factor. So we're gonna get a table that has eigenvalues. We're gonna see one eigenvalue of a 0.5 or a by 5.36. That is quite a bit above one. That's actually a very strong eigenvalue. So this first factor is large it actually explains 35% of the total variance. We can see there's three other factors that are going to be retained because they're above a one, but they're not as big. So they're just over one, whereas this one is quite a bit over one. And we can see that this uh, factor two, also called component two, explains 10%, factor three explains about 8%, and factor four explains about 7% of the total variance within this survey within all of these items at least. 
And then another thing that we can see is between all four of those, we're explaining about 61% of the total variance. We are also going to get a scree plot. And a scree plot is looking at, or it's graphing the eigenvalues. If you have one large factor and a bunch of smaller ones or ones that may not actually be real, you're gonna have a nice elbow is what this is called. So here we have one strong factor and then we have an elbow of kind of just the rest of the factors that just trail off. So this shows me that I have one big one, maybe another one right here, and then these just really kind of just trail off. This scree plot is a little bit less clear with an elbow. The elbow is really right here, in which case we have one strong packet of variance, one strong factor. We definitely have another factor in this one, so we have two factors so far and then potentially a third, but this is where they trail off. And we're not really sure if these are real factors or just due to chance. So the first thing that you have to decide, which is sometimes the hardest, is how many factors do you actually retain? We can look at the scree plot, we can look at eigenvalues over one, and we should be thinking about conceptual definitions and understandings. So if we are retaining a factor, then all of the items that are grouping in that factor should be about something similar. <laughs> there should be some kind of conceptual definition or understanding that we can add and call it something, like the social programs. We don't have just a random question thrown in there that's not about social programs. So if we still are not clear based on doing these, we can run a parallel analysis, um, which helps verify that the factor is real and not just due to chance in that data set that all those items just happen to group together. There's a whole other video that I have on parallel analysis if you want to choose to do that. One tip that I have is when you are looking at what items group on what factor, it is so much easier if you copy it to Word and then highlight all of the values over 0.4, look down the column, and see what items are loading on that factor and then name them based on the content. We're gonna do this in a minute. So in SPSS, we're gonna to go to Analyze, Dimension Reduction, and then Factor. There are some tabs that we are going to make sure that we add some things. We wanna add KMO and Bartlett, we wanna add the screen plot, and we wanna add Fear Max Rotation. So to apply classical test theory with factor analysis, exploratory factor analysis specifically, there is a bunch of different things that we're gonna be looking at. First two are about, is this even appropriate to run on this data set? Number three, we're looking at how the item compares to the whole. We did that in the last video. In number four, we're gonna be looking at the eigenvalues and percent explained. In number five, we're gonna be looking at factors to retain and relative size of factors. So ones that are large, ones that are not large. You will get a components matrix, but I'm going to recommend skipping that and using the rotated matrix instead. And this is where we're going to highlight the values over 0.4 to see what items load on each factor. And then we're going to name it based on item content. So to look at this, we're going to do a split screen. That worked out really nicely. So here I have tables that I've pulled straight from SPSS into Word because I just think it's a lot easier to work with this. So the KMO, we want a 0.8 or above, and we can see that this shows that it is adequate for use. The Bartlett's test, we want to be significant, which this one is. And what this is doing is it is showing that our sample and verifying that this is appropriate for this type of analysis. Number three, this is our commonalities. So here we're looking at how each item groups or mm, relates to the whole. So we can see that these first two relate really nicely. So they have a nice correlation to the whole. We can see that number three is pretty low. It's above that 0.4 rule. That's concerning to me. If in the, which we saw this actually in the first video, that number three just was a little bit questionable. It was right on the edge of, if it was good or not. Now I'm having further evidence that this may not be a good question. We're going to keep that in mind for a minute. So I can go through all of my different questions. Here is that eigenvalue chart table. 
So here we're going to look at eigenvalues above a, a 1, and we're going to see that we have four components, four factors that are going to be retained. Scrolling down to the screw plot, we can again see that there is a nice elbow. So we have one major factor, and the elbow makes me kind of question these last three on if they are real. So if they are really different ideas, or if they're just based on chance. We're going to continue working through that. So this is my rotated component matrix. Here I'm going to go through very quickly and I'm going to highlight everything over a 0.4. And I know this data pretty well, so that's why this is going nice and fast. So we can see that item three, which again, we said that was a problem, is loading really low. We don't have a strong factor loading. It is above a 0.4, but it's not nearly as nicely related as these two. So these are both a 0.8, and we can see that down here there is also another just barely 0.4. This is another problematic item because it's loading on two different factors. So this item is a problem. I'm not a fan of it. And then we have this item is also a problem. I'm not a huge fan. And just to be clear, this item is about reading data that's broken down for me. This one is about breaking down their own data based on different things. So it makes sense that these two items group together. It's about data analysis. And this one is about assessing prior knowledge. So it doesn't have that, that logical content connection with these two, which is why I think it's a problem. So this would be my last ditch effort, and I would say, I don't like this item, and I'm going to get rid of it. But we can now see that item one, factor one, is definitely our largest packet of variance. There's more items that group here. And when we look through what these different ones are, it's about knowledge is what I called it. This one is about data analysis. This one is both about feedback, you can see. And this one is about revising and reflecting on instruction.